Good afternoon. I think, uh, I think I've been invited here to stir things up a little, so I'll try my very best to fulfil that brief. Um, before I start, it would be quite nice to know how friendly the audience is. Do we have a single Zopa customer in the audience? Not one. Well, that's really sad. I'm disappointed. So I, I, I hope most of you know a bit about what we do. Um, but for those who don't, we were the first peer-to-peer -peer lending business in the world. Um, we're the UK's and Europe's biggest. Um, we've lent nearly half a billion pounds, of which 200 million has come in the last 12 months. We've just about got one and a quarter, one and a half percent market share now of the UK unsecured personal loans market. So we're definitely subscale in bank terms, but we're uh, beginning to make inroads and, and growing very, very fast. Um, ultimately, we exist to provide a better deal, and we provide a better deal by cutting out banks and providing a better lower cost loan to our borrowers and a better savings rate to our savers or, or lenders, depending on what you want to call them. But I'm actually not going to talk very much about Zopa. I want to talk about innovation. Um, I think the themes of today are innovation, trust, brand. So I'll try and cover most of those. And I want to talk about genuine customer-focused value innovation, um, which I think is in very short supply in this particular industry. Then I'll move on to, I think, the main subject of the day, which is trust. And I haven't prepared anything, but if I've got time at the end, I'll talk a bit about brand. And I've got a short clip that I'll show you as well if we get to it. Um, Paul Volcker, famous man, now often known as the, the author of the Volcker Rule. But before he came up with the Volcker Rule, as you, many of you will know, he was chairman of the Fed. And he also came up with a, a quote that's often used when describing innovation. He said in 2009 that the most important innovation that had come out of financial services in the previous 20 years was the ATM. And he said that in the context of the crisis. So he said that at a time when the world had shown that the very ingeniousness of the banking industry um, exhibited by people who probably work within a mile of here and a mile of where he resided in Wall Street, that very ingeniousness had served to undermine trust and damage trust in what, have, what has become such a distrusted sector and left the humble ATM as the greatest innovation. So given the really bad record of innovation in the financial services industry, I want to take some examples from some other industries um, of the, the kind of innovation I'm talking about. I'm talking about innovation that focuses on value. And I think when you focus on value, you look at the value chain and you take things out of that chain that consumers don't value and you do the things that they do value very well. Um, a, a, an often used example is the airline industry. So pioneered in the US by Southwest Airlines, copied in Europe by Ryanair and EasyJet. They understood that consumers didn't value low quality food and seat numbers, but they really did value cheap tickets and punctuality. So they re-engineered the whole process to focus on those two things and built incredibly successful businesses, all three of them. You might not necessarily like everything you read about Ryanair, but it's a damn good business. Um, but I want to tell you another story about an industry that I know, I know really well. So I spent the first 10 years of my life in the motor industry. Um, the motor industry is not a famously innovative industry either, but there's one fantastic example of innovation which I want to tell you about today. So 40 years ago, um, many people in the room, I'm sure, drive and get that, have to go through the ritual of taking your car in for a service. So 40 years ago, garage workshops were located, as actually they still are today, typically in really large, flashy dealerships out of town, in fantastically inconvenient locations. Uh, inconvenient in the sense that none of you work anywhere near them. So you're forced to trek to some distant location uh, at the same time as everyone else makes the same trek. So a bit like hotels, uh, everyone checks in and checks out at the same time, and they haven't worked that out either. Um, so you'd have huge queues in this rather flashy dealership with people waiting to hand their keys over uh, to have their car serviced. Now then they went through a rather interesting retail um, process. Normally when we buy something, we understand exactly what we buy. You go and buy a pair of jeans and we know we're buying a pair of jeans. When you're buying service in a workshop, you don't buy service, you buy a thing called labor. Um, labor is not a commodity that you necessarily understand or even value. Now the labor charges are really high. Um, so within the M25, I'm led to believe that service labor charges are now reaching about 200 pounds an hour which incidentally is about the same as the charge out rate of a junior city accountant or lawyer. Um, and these charges are very high to justify the incredibly smart premises, uh, which you don't value, um, the, very highly train the, the very high levels of training of the mechanics themselves, which sadly they don't always exhibit. Um, and because of this I inconvenience, um, customers, as I say, have to go back in the evening, pick up their car, and pay usually a very large amount of money for something that they don't really value uh, for a retail experience they don't understand. 
Now, why am I telling you that story? I'm telling you a story about something that are known as universal garages, full service garages. Um, and I think there's a parallel within our, within our industry. And the parallel, parallel gets a bit clearer and starts relating to Zopa. So someone thought of a better way of doing this, or at least for part of it. And the important point is to emphasize the part. So in 1971, there was a young Scottish entrepreneur. I called him Glaswegian once, and uh, I got a note, the powers of social media. I got a note back saying, I'm not from Glasgow, I'm from Edinburgh, which, um, as Penny Higgins pointed out earlier, is an important difference. Um, his, name, his name was Tom Farmer, and he was on holiday in the US. And he was um, traveling, he just sold his first business as a very young man. He was traveling around, and he, he observed these things called muffler shops. And he thought, well, that's very interesting. We don't have muffler shops in the UK. What do they do? And he worked out that these muffler shops sold a very, very narrow range of parts. And these parts were in extremely high margins. Muffler is American for exhaust pipe. Um, these parts had very high margins. They were typically quite ubiquitous, so they fitted on lots and lots of different cars. Um, the people who fitted them didn't need any training. Basically, you could train a school leaver to change an exhaust in probably two weeks' intensive training. So he worked out that you could... Um, locate these facilities in very, very small buildings uh, because they didn't need to carry very much stock. Um, and because they were small facilities, he could locate them in town centres, revolutionary, near where people worked. Uh, and he invented a business that he subsequently renamed QuickFit. Now, QuickFit revolutionised um, the sale of tyres, exhausts, and a very small number of what are often called consumable parts in the motor industry. Now, the interesting part of that story is that within 20 years the entire market, not part of the market, but the entire market, which is worth about a billion pounds a year, 15% of the UK after-sales market moved entirely from universal garages to the quick-fit operators, and of which, of course, there were many, because he got copy. Like all disruptors, people tend to get copy. Now, the reason I like this story um, is because we believe there are quite interesting parallels between what we do and the disruption of quick-fit. So we've identified a very small part of banking. We focus on that part of banking and that part of banking only, and we do that bit simply better. We, we beat, effectively, we, we, we beat um, the banks we believe in every dimension. So QuickFit got to offer the same parts fitted at the time of a customer's, com at, at a time convenient to a customer, in a location convenient to, to a customer, cheaper than the incumbent operator. So it's kind of what, what's, not to what's not to like about that. If you then take the parallel to our business and say, well, what have we done? We've recreated most of what a bank does. But again, important emphasis on the word most. So we built a credit and risk function. And we've, we operate the best personal loan book in the country. Our, our default rates on the money we've lent in the last three years are 20 basis points, which my understanding is at least 10 times better than any UK high street bank. Um, we, so we built a credit and risk function that works. We built back office operations that make sure that people pay the right amount of money and the lenders who supply the money get paid the right amount of money. We obviously market. Um, the one really important bit of banking that we haven't recreated is what banks call treasury. So treasury is a wonderful invention um, which allows them to borrow short from savers and lend long to their borrowers. Now treasury makes enormous sense. So in fact, some people have described the treasury function, which is often called fractional reserve banking, as the most important industrial invention since the wheel. Uh, well, Paul Volcker didn't agree with that in his description of the ATM. Um, and the treasury function is something that, at the moment, is under enormous scrutiny. It's under regulatory scrutiny and has regulatory uncertainty. And from time to time, these things blow up. And that's what caused the last credit crisis, arguably, um, certain operators borrowing short and lending long. Now, we don't do that. We simply have a very, very simple investment product which matches the maturity or the term with the, with the term that the borrower wishes to borrow. So it's incredibly stable. It's why Andy Haldane of the Bank of England has described our model as, as, as stable and efficient, because it exhibits no treasury risk. Now, there are certain downsides to that. It means that our savers are locked in for the time that a borrower is borrowing the money. But you know, on the basis that it's a better return and it's predictable and everything is telegraphed up front, that doesn't seem to worry them too much. Another efficiency in the model is we offer only unsecured loans. So we don't offer secured loans. We don't offer second charge loans. We don't offer mortgages. I'd love to offer mortgages one day. I think we'd probably have to have a different source of capital to the kind of people who, who live in this room, or sit in this room. But the very nature of not taking security, and frankly, I don't want to take a second charge on a loan. I don't want to be responsible. There's no point having a charge unless you're going to use it. And I don't want to be responsible for evicting 
someone from my house. So if I'm never going to use that charge, what's the point of me taking security? And by not taking security, I cut out an entire layer of admin and complication. So from a business perspective, it's extraordinarily simple uh, to administrate. We also don't have a branch network. Now, that's kind of obvious, isn't it? But I keep, I keep being struck by bankers who talk to me about the strengths of the branch network and the importance of what they call their customer relationships. Uh, I went to a presentation the other day. It was fantastically entertaining. Um, but it was all about how the economics of branch deposits are much stronger than deposits anywhere else, apparently because branch customers value service and relationships so highly. Um, so uh, the question to me becomes, why can't you combine that value with great service? So we've won um, MoneyWise Most Trusted Personal Loan Provider four years in a row now. I think if we win it again, I'm going to ask for the trophy, uh, ask to keep the trophy. And, and two weeks ago, we went to a Money Facts Award, and we were nominated for category of Best Personal Loan Provider. So we were full of optimism, and indeed, we duly won. And right at the end of the evening, in fact, it wasn't quite at the end of the evening, I, I was so pleased that we'd won this award for Best Personal Loan, I went to the bar to buy some champagne. And while I was at the bar, um, they announced a special award um, for best customer service across the whole industry. And that included mortgage providers, current account providers, credit card holders, uh, credit card companies, and my favorite pet insurance companies. And we won that. Sadly, I wasn't there to see it because I was buying champagne. And Mark, I'm sorry, but we beat you. <laughs> now, we also get told of the stickiness of, of branch deposits. So not only apparently branch savers prepared to accept lower rates in return for this great concept of mythical service, this mythical concept of service. But they also, apparently, the, you know, branch deposits are much stickier. And we actually read quite a lot about how branch deposits were stickier during the credit crisis than, for example, the deposit to ING. And it, it was true. ING had a problem because lots of people wanted their money back. So uh, the question I, I have to wonder is, is it, is it fundamental to the psyche that, that, that banks treat branch customers as stupider or lazier? Uh, that they don't deserve the same treatment as people online, that they have to pay people online a, a higher premium? Or how about addressing the problem of stickiness by what I described earlier, by matching maturities, by getting people to agree up front in a transparent way that they are going to lend money for two, three, four years? A recent survey by the American Bankers Association um, found that 57% of customers over the age of 55, so this was the lowest proportion, uh, do all their banking online haven't been to a branch for years. So if that's 57% of people over 55, what is it for 17-year-olds? I've got an eight-year-old son and a six-year-old daughter. I think by the time they're 18, they won't even know what a branch is. Banks continue to invest vastly more money, though, in that distribution channel. I thought it was really encouraging when um, Antonio said this morning that they created a digital bit of the business, because to my knowledge, they're the first people to do that in the world. Um, historically, digital has always been part of retail. And it's always been the poor relation. It's never had the same investment. So you get this sort of self-fulfilling prophecy that um, the telephone, with the notable exception of businesses like Mark's, telephone, internet, and increasingly mobile channels are neglected and don't receive the same investment. The level of investment is based on this idea that the branch is king. And of course, that's self-fulfilling, because then those channels don't work as optimally, and people are forced to go back to the branch. And some clever person in the business justifies the investment decision on the basis that things did actually get transacted in the branch after all. So our view is slightly different. We, we think that actually what all customers want is value. And value transcends this idea of a flawed relationship. So I think the, the winners in this new age of financial services are going to be those businesses that do provide value in a narrow, focused manner. I think it came up in a, in a conversation earlier that that's where disruption will lie. PayPal's a great example. PayPal will take the payment space, or could take the payment space, and from there begin to innovate and take other bits of banking. And that finally brings me on to the subject of, of trust. And of course, we should all know that it's really hard to trust people that you don't have a good, uh, sorry, it's very hard to have a good relationship with people you don't trust. So loss of trust to me is, is very simple. And it comes from not putting your customer right at the front center of what you do. It's where you use the undoubted cleverness of your people to benefit your position rather than benefit the position of your customers. And I think if you look back, that's, after all, what banks did. At its worst, it's been revealed in the scandals we all know about at PPI and selling, which is the greatest financial services scandal in the UK in history, uh, or interest rate swaps in small businesses, which seems to be growing rather fast and catching up quickly as well. And recent reports from the FCA about still, uh, banks still paying their staff uh, 
sales incentives just mystify me why, why anyone would think that was a good idea. Or uh, actually at a more corporate level, big banks' decision to exit the money laundering, but money, money, forgive Freudian slip, the, <laughs> the money services businesses, um, giving, small com giving small customers uh, only 30 days notice, so leaving businesses which have used those services for many years no, no choice at all. Or similarly, big banks exiting equipment finance, the leasing business, again with, cu with, with, with customers who placed orders for equipment that they ultimately couldn't take delivery of because the bank had decided to pull out of leasing. Or to move to investment banking, and I don't think that's necessarily the flavor of the room, um, but perhaps the clearest example of forgetting the customer is the enormous conflict of interest by betting against your own customer in the derivatives market. And that's something that the major banks have accepted fines for. They have no, no one, of course, has admitted liability. So what to do? Well, as far as I'm concerned, these things would never have happened if banks simply designed products and services that provide genuine value and put the customer and not their own P&L first. And that ideally, the products that customers like and tell their friends about. And I'm not talking about some kind of sort of weird altruistic nirvana, because some of the, some, some of the companies that are most profitable, and we've heard so much today about Apple, but let's not forget the level of profitability, the level of margin that company achieves while putting its customers front, dead, and center and providing their customers with joy. And I certainly think it's very sad if financial services doesn't aspire to providing that level of delight in terms of interaction. I could tell you some stories that I think get pretty close uh, from some of our customers in testimonial terms. I'll never forget a lesson that was banged into me at my first job. It was that, that, was that the customer pays my wages. Now that's a real cliche. But I wonder, and it's a lesson I've never forgotten, but I wonder how many people in this industry genuinely, genuinely think like that. In the meantime, I think it leaves a fantastic opportunity for people like us who use low cost, often narrow business models that focus on customers. And the efficiency we, we exhibit will allow us to take share in our particular sector from the banks. And like QuickFit and its competitors to take, I believe, the majority of that business from an incumbent too busy thinking about making money for itself rather than serving the interests of its customers. And for me, that's what disruption's all about. Now, I hadn't prepared anything, but I was, if I've got time, um, I've just talk, since, since we are at a brand finance do, I'll just talk a little bit about brand. Um, and I think slightly unusually, we launched Oprah 2005, so nine years ago. I think slightly unusually for a start, firstly, we were very well funded, which was fortunate. We, had a, we thought was a big idea. Um, and we spent rather longer, I think, thinking about brands. Startups often sort of charge ahead, and there's a great thing in startup land which is all about iterate, test and learn, iterate, test and learn. And I think that's fantastic for you know, optimizing website conversion, all that kind of thing. It's also great for launching incremental product changes, but it's not so great to do with a brand. Um, I'm not a brand marketer by training, but I do believe that brands require serious thought a priori rather than a, a sort of iterative test and learn approach. So we thought very hard about our brand, and we decided to make people the center of our brand. Uh, so the differentiator, if you like, was about collaboration um, and people working together to get a better deal. And I think we've carried a flavor of that with us throughout. I think it's positioned us very well. We've never had any money, though. So we've never spent any money promoting our business at all. So we've grown to the point where we've lent money to about, as I said, half a billion quid, we've lent money to about 75, 80,000 people. Um, and we've got about 55,000 active lender customers without spending any money on advertising. So the lender base has come entirely through word of mouth um, and some PR. Um, we've been fortunate enough to have a story that's been written about and covered by broadcast. Um, and the borrower base has come to some extent through the same means, but also through direct channels, which are you know, not invested in, if you like. Um, and we've just raised 15 million pounds. So Zopa is an inherently profitable business now. Um, and I'm really excited that a couple of weeks ago we announced we'd raised 15 million pounds from some, I believe, very far-sighted people who want to help us build our brand. 